Hi, everybody. I see people are entering here. Um, we're going to give it a few minutes or a few seconds, really, to get everyone in the room. Um, but we welcome you to put your name and organization in the chat and introduce yourselves if you'd like. And let us know if you've intervened or participated in a rate case before. All right, I'm seeing that chat is disabled. Hopefully we can get that fixed because we are hoping people can introduce themselves and just let us know who's here and if you've intervened or participated in a rate case. But while we have our folks working on that, I'll get us started. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to our ELPC Thinks webinar. We're here today to discuss putting energy justice in rate cases and specifically talking about the ongoing Excel rate case at the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. Um, quick heads up, we will be recording this webinar and streaming live on Facebook to share it for uh, those who were not able to join us. Um, my name is Erica McConnell. I'm a staff attorney at the Environmental Law and Policy Center, and I'm representing the Just Solar Coalition in the Excel rate case. And before turning it over to our three panelists today, I'll provide some uh, backgrounds on, um, on the rate case. Uh, for anyone who might not be familiar, just some basic context. A utility rate case like Excel's is the formal process at a state utility commission to determine the amounts a regulated utility can charge customers to recover its costs um, in providing electricity or gas service. And a key function of the State Utility Commission is to ensure that the utility rates are just and reasonable through the commission's evaluation of the evidence presented in these rate cases. Um, often with big sums of money on the line, these tend to be major cost and time intensive proceedings and have few participants beyond the utility. Currently in its rate case, um, at the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, Excel is seeking a nearly half billion dollar rate increase over a three three year period. Um, and as part of this request, they're also seeking a significant increase to their return on equity or ROE, which is the return that the utility earns on its investments, or in other words, its profit. Um, Last April, members of the Just Solar Coalition intervened in Excel's case, specifically Community Power and Cooperative Energy Futures, both of whom we have here today, um, along with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light and Vote Solar, and ELPC is representing the Just Solar Coalition members in the case. Uh, the Just Solar Coalition intervened in Excel's rate case for two overarching reasons. First, affordability. They were alarmed by the magnitude of Excel's proposed rate increase and concerned about its impact on customers, particularly low wealth and other marginalized customers. And second, to ensure that Excel's investments, which they're uh, seeking cost recovery for in the case, expand access to local clean energy resources like solar uh, storage, energy efficiency, uh, for all of Excel customers, including those same low wealth and marginalized customers. And one of our central arguments has been that improving local clean energy access is critical to enabling a more just, equitable, and resilient electric system with opportunities for communities to build local wealth and jobs through ownership of those resources. At its core, our position in the case uh, is that principles of energy justice are integral to ensuring equitable, just, and reasonable rates as required by law. Through testimony, we provided evidence of the inequities and injustices present in the electric system. And we've argued that only by recognizing and addressing those inequities and injustices uh, can the commission fulfill its just and reasonable rate-making obligations. Therefore, the commission should review Excel's rate case proposals through an energy justice lens 
And that's what the Just Solar Coalition has done in our review and recommendations to the commission in the case. Uh, we assembled a really powerful team of expert witnesses to file written testimony this past fall. We have one of our expert witnesses here today, Dr. Gabe Chan, who can talk more about some of his testimony in the case in a moment. Um, we also had a community organizer in North Minneapolis, Christelle Porter, as our central witness, explaining the Just Solar Coalition's goals and vision, and also describing her own and her community's experiences with Excel's uh, rates and programs. In addition to Gabe and Christelle, we had three more expert witnesses, uh, Dr. Lorenzo Kristoff, who provided compelling testimony on what a future grid with high quantities of local clean energy could look like, which was intended to help the commission establish a future vision to inform its nearer term decisions in the case. And then we had Carl Rabago and Cody Davis testifying on rate design and distribution investment issues respectively and providing immediate concrete recommendations for the commission on Excel's proposals. Um, briefing in the case wrapped up in early February, and we expect a decision from the commission on June 30th of this year. Um, our panelists today will talk about energy justice and the substance of Excel's case in more detail, though, of course, we can only scratch the surface. So all of our testimony and briefing is public if you find uh, that you want to dig in further. So. We are honored today to have joining us two of our clients from the Just Solar Coalition, uh, Alice Madden from Community Power and Timothy Denherter thomas from Cooperative Energy Futures. And in addition to Alice and Timothy, we're also delighted to have Dr. Gabe Chan, Associate Professor at the U University of Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs, who served as one of our expert witnesses in his independent capacity. We're gonna hear from each of them and then have a bit of discussion and open it up to Q&A. Uh, to ask a question, um, click the Q&A icon on your screen and type in your question, or I'm seeing all these messages. Hopefully we have the chat working. Um, that's another place to go if it is indeed working, but the Q&A button should work as well. Um, so first I will pass the mic to Gabe, who will discuss some of what he covered in his testimony in the case, including how we framed uh, the concept of energy justice and how it fits into the existing regulatory framework, um, as well as some of his analysis in support of why it needs to be addressed in the Excel rate case. Go ahead, Gabe. Great, thanks so much, Erica. Uh, and thank you to the members of the Just Solar Coalition for uh, inviting me to serve as an expert in this case and for all of you for attending today. Now, I have a number of slides today. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen uh, in particular to uh, be able to share uh, some of the visuals and graphics uh, about energy justice in this case. I really wanted to talk about uh, three things briefly here. First, how we're defining energy justice in this rate case. Second, how that definition of energy justice is really core to the authority of public utility commissions generally and in rate cases specifically, and then talk about some of the Excel energy specific data that we use to illustrate why the existing system fails to achieve energy justice and why changes are needed. So first, how do we define energy justice uh, for the purposes of our testimony in this rate case? We adopt a definition from the Institute for Energy Justice that defines energy justice as the goal of achieving equity in both the social and economic participation in the energy system, while also remediating social, economic, and health burdens on those historically harmed by the energy system. We then take this definition, which is complex, and break it down into four key tenets that really emerge from activists around the country and around the world and the academic scholarship that break down energy justice into four parts recognitional justice, the who, who are we talking about, which communities that have been ignored or misrepresented are important to think about when we think about energy justice. Procedural justice, which is the how, how are decisions made and what are those processes of decision-making uh, across the many different venues in which the energy system changes. Distributional justice, which is the what, ensuring that the benefits and burdens of the energy system are equitably distributed and then finally, restorative justice. Why are we doing this? Why are we thinking about energy justice, particularly in light of the historic harms and preventing future harms? So we use this as a bit of a framework to understand how 
uh, this rate case could be viewed, and generally the authority of public utility commissions can be viewed in alignment with these principles. So how does energy justice fit into the authority of public utility commissions and uh, uh, particularly their authority regarding rate cases? Here, I've included three excerpts from Minnesota statute, but actually looking across all 50 states and federal law, these similar kinds of normative principles carry through throughout public interest authority. Uh, the founding statute of Minnesota says it is in the public interest that public utilities be regulated uh, as, as the subsequent statute spells out. In particular, with regards to rates, statute says that every rate must be just and reasonable, and rates should not be unreasonably preferential, unreasonably prejudicial, or discriminatory. And then finally, no public utility shall create any preference or advantage to any person or subject any person to any unreasonable prejudice or disadvantage. So these overarching normative principles have gone through decades and decades of legal uh, wrangling. And I think ultimately the strongest case for you know, how to interpret this public interest authority is that utility regulators have the essential authority to give active and affirmative protection to the public interest. And particularly by responding to changing conditions, new data, new information about what's important to advance the public interest. And so we argue through our testimony that an energy justice lens gives that interpretation for the just and reasonable standard that gives primacy to the kinds of data and perspectives that best protect, protect the public interest, particularly for disadvantaged populations. And when we think about the rate case specifically, this is a critical venue to make this argument because the rate case is where billions of dollars are going to be allocated that are going to have long lifetimes. The, the infrastructure that's being proposed in any rate case, in this rate case in particular, are gonna last for decades. And those costs are gonna be paid for decades through rates. The rate case isn't the only venue where those kinds of decisions matter. The integrated resource plan, the integrated distribution plan, many other venues also matter, but rate cases are critical venues for protecting the public interest because of the number of dollars that are at stake. So in testimony in particular, what I do in uh, my uh, initial testimony and uh, sur rebuttal testimony is build out some of this data that I think really highlights just how far the current system is from an energy justice system. I wanna run through about four figures that are from my testimony that really illustrate why we think it's so important that this argument uh, and this framing of energy justice needs to be incorporated in interpretation of advancing the public interest. So first, this is a figure I, I created based off of the US Energy Information Administration's Residential Energy Consumption Survey, which is a survey of households across the country asking, hundreds of questions about energy use. But in particular, there's been a lot of emphasis on their questions about energy insecurity, which can mean receiving a notice of disconnection, uh, not being able to pay energy bills, uh, foregoing food or medicine in order to pay for energy. And what I've done here is compare the national figures to Minnesota. Nationally, about 27% of households report some form of energy insecurity. That number is actually lower in Minnesota, where it's only 17% of households reporting some form of energy insecurity. But then when you break this down by self-reported race, what you see is that actually black households in Minnesota and households of more than one race report much higher levels of energy insecurity than white households. And the racial disparity is significantly larger when it comes to energy insecurity in Minnesota compared to nationally. This is what my colleague, uh, Professor Sam Myers refers to as the Minnesota paradox that quality of life in Minnesota appears to be much better looking at averages, but actually Minnesota has some of the highest racial disparities of any state in the country. This data shows uh, figures uh, now looking at energy burden, which is the percent of income spent on energy. High energy burden is typically considered when 6% or more of income uh, goes to energy. And here what I've done is look now controlling for a lot of factors, looking at just single family households, looking just at the Minneapolis-St. Paul area served by Excel Energy, and then looking now by different income groups and by owner and renter status. And we see again, this large racial disparity that actually continues even controlling for income levels uh, when it comes to energy burden. The next figure I wanna show is utility disconnections, involuntary di disconnection from electric service 
When a household fails to pay its bills, the utility can disconnect that household from service after a number of notices. And what this figure shows is that looking at different areas served by Excel, looking at the left, as those areas increase in the percent of people of color who live there, the rate of involuntary utility disconnection goes up from about half a percent for those areas with less than 20% people of color to more than more like three and a half percent for households that are majority people of color. Now you might think, well, perhaps that is due to uh, some confounding factors like income, for example. Well, the figure on the right now controls for income and shows that those racial disparities continue that as an area has more people of color, there's more disconnections, even controlling for income. Last figure here shows now not, um, not utility disconnections, but actually service interruptions. Extended outages of over 12 hours, I also show are significantly higher in the Minneapolis green zones that have more people of color and are lower income. And so again, there's this disparity in the system, which all begs the question here is how can we have just and reasonable rates if we don't seek to recognize and restore some of these harms that are shown in this data. Last thing I'll just mention is a lot of my testimony comes from a law review article I wrote with my colleague, Alex Klass, who's at the University of Michigan, uh, currently on leave at the Department of Energy. Uh, and if you'd like to read more of some of the arguments and case studies from states across the country, I encourage you to check out this article, which is free to view online um, and happy to share the link in the chat as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gabe. Um... And just reminding everyone to please put any questions in the Q&A. We're seeing some questions coming through. Sorry for the confusion about the chat, but stick with the Q&A. We're having technical difficulties with the chat. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Timothy Denherter thomas who will provide some more information about the Just Solar Coalition and how and why um, Just Solar Coalition came to this case as well as some discussion of the relevance of local clean energy to energy justice in rate cases. Go ahead, Timothy. Thank you, Erica, and thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, as Erica mentioned, I'm Timothy Denner-Thomas. Uh, I work with Cooperative Energy Futures, which is a community energy co-op um, doing renewable energy development, and along with Community Power and Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light and uh, Minnesota Renewable Now, uh, we've been really excited to participate in this rate case. Uh, and I wanted to start out just by sharing a little bit about who the Just Solar Coalition is and, and why we got involved. Uh, the Just Solar Coalition has been around uh, about five years now, and uh, we really came together as a group of community-based organizations, uh, advocacy nonprofits, and uh, community-focused uh, solar developers, really with a focus of how do we bring justice and equity to the solar industry. So this includes piloting projects that are actually direct examples of how low-income people, people of color, renters can get access to clean energy and own that energy, um, really empowering and mobilizing communities to, to get involved, uh, shifting policy, whether that's at a regulatory or, or legislative level to uh, create more access and benefits for um, disadvantaged communities uh, around clean energy and solar in particular, uh, and also shifting the market and shifting how um, uh, the industry prioritizes both access to ownership of uh, and also workforce and economic development opportunities. Uh, in the regulatory space, we've been involved in um, several different proceedings in the last few years. Uh, the integrated resource plan, uh, which started in 2019 and ended in 2022, um, was a, a major one where we were really pushing uh, several of our parties were pushing um, what what do we need to evaluate around the utilities resourcing of energy um, to make sure that we're adequately considering the role that distributed energy can play and the way that it can actually reduce costs for all ratepayers. Uh, similarly, several of our organizations participated in the integrated distribution plan, really to look at Xcel Energy's investments in local grids and whether and how that's empowering local renewable energy. And uh, we decided at the beginning of this rate case that it really was the time for us to dig in on the rate case side. And for our coalition, this is the first time ever intervening in a rate case. Uh, and you know, kind of like Gabe said, part of the reason why this is so essential is this is where the money is. Um, you know, it was a proposal by Excel to, to raise rates by 
uh, around at this point around half a billion dollars. Um, the original proposal was up to about 21% increase on people's energy costs. Uh, and one of the things we found as we dug into the rate case is that while a lot of the logic or the narrative was around this is preparing our grid for the future, uh, we really weren't seeing a lot that was increasing access to local renewable energy, and especially not uh, any analysis or evaluation of how is that being done in an equitable way. And I just wanted to take a brief step back and, and highlight that all around the country, um, we hear uh, a lot of policy conversation and um, utilities in particular using this talking point that, well, you know, it's all very well and good that local clean energy is, is helping customers save money, uh, but that's not accessible. It's not equitable. It's mostly serving middle and upper income populations. And then go on to say that that's a reason why we need to be doing less local renewable energy. And our coalition's position is, is really first and foremost that that's backwards. The fact that people can save money and that our overall, our communities can have lower cost energy through local renewables is exactly the reason why not only independent organizations, but also utilities and regulators need to prioritize making sure that distributed and local renewable energy is equitable and accessible to everyone. So the approach that we've taken in this rate case is really twofold. It's number one, um, how do we make sure that uh, we are limiting the level of rate increases to protect our community from high costs, but also that we're making sure that the types of things that the utility is allowed to invest in are empowering and enabling uh, communities, especially low-income communities and communities of color, to make the shift to local clean energy in a way that's going to basically lock in and get them on a, on a track to more affordable energy over time, as opposed to this constant cycle. Uh, of increasing costs that we've seen in the utility sector in the in the last several years and, and decades, honestly. And I think this is really pointing out two key connections that in a rate case, we're setting what the utility is spending money on. And number one, that is locking in costs. It is, it is saying, okay, you're going to make these investments and, and people, the general public is going to bear the cost over a long period of time, whatever future decisions are made. And you're also setting up infrastructure that will either enable or lock out opportunities for communities to directly connect to and participate in the grid. And so a lot of our engagement has really been to prioritize that the utilities need to be uh, reducing investments that are just continuing grid as usual or a grid that is not enabling local communities to participate and need to be prioritizing investments that way. And a lot of the testimony, uh, both that Lorenzo contributed around a vision of that more decentralized and community-based grid, and also a lot of the testimony that Christelle Porter brought up, um, working directly with low-income communities and, and door knocking and having conversations with um, hundreds of people uh, across you know, thousands of interactions about really what type of energy system do we need to see, um, is all about that connection between uh, the, the investments we make in our distribution grid and our local grid and how that needs to be prioritized based on the service quality issues that Gabe mentioned, uh, you know, to prevent disconnections and also to enable local communities to participate in clean energy. So um, I'm, I'm going to end there, but just to, to highlight really the central connection that we are trying to make in this rate case that affordability is actually intimately tied to uh, how are we equipping communities, especially low-income communities and communities of color, to take advantage of and participate uh, really as, as equals and as, as champions of um, a grid that is uh, matched to our local need uh, and is not going to require continuous and ongoing infrastructure investments that burden low-income communities. So with that, I will I will pass it over. Thank you, Timothy. Um, and yes, again, questions into the Q and A. We see them coming in, and and after Alice speaks, we will um, start answering them. Um, I'll pass it over to 
Alice Madden now, who will describe at a high level uh, Just Solar Coalition's positions on affordability and rate design in the case, and also talk about the role and testimony of our community organizer witness, Christelle Porter. Um, and Alice will discuss as well some of the procedural justice concerns that uh, the Just Solar Coalition raised in the case. Go ahead, Alice. Thanks, Erica, and thanks everybody for being here. It's cool to see some familiar names, and I just want to shout out some of our Just Solar Coalition members on the call, um, Jenna and Carl and Lorenzo and Puglia. Uh, it's really great to see you guys here. And some other interveners in the case, I saw Citizens Utility Board and Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy and um, some other friendly faces like Jean and Sam and Melina and Priya. So it's nice to see you all. Um, and also shout out to the other states in the room. It's just cool to see folks from Hawaii and Iowa and uh, Michigan and New York. So um, very cool to be here with you. Um, so just at a high level, what we talked about around rate design and just some of the things beyond what Timothy mentioned and beyond what Gabe mentioned about what our focus was. Um, so rate design, or uh, also known as who is charged what, <laughs> Uh, return on equity, also known as profit, energy bill affordability or affordability programs, um, the base charge or monthly fixed fees that residents are charged, and then some of these like incentives that are doled out to large businesses. Um, and not to get like there's a bunch of stuff that we called out in there and I think maybe in follow up we have a, a sort of de jargoned version or a layman's person, you know, view of, of what we asked for which we could send around. Um, if you want to get into all the details, but um, just to highlight a couple of things, um, one of the things that Excel has been asking for is about a 17% jump in the base charge. So that monthly fix fee you can't get out of no matter how much energy you use or how much efficiency you, uh, you know, upgrade your house or apartment with. Um, and actually we advocated for a lowered charge that would more accurately reflect the actual cost of residential customers to the grid. Um, and there's some other conversations about how much apartment dwellers actually cost the grid compared to a household that has a single family house. Um, so we advocated for a lowered charge there. Um, we also supported, but then uh, added onto a low income rate discount for, for folks on assistance, um, including, um, uh, so the discount originally would be about 300 kilowatt hours per month. Um, would be at a lowered charge and we're saying yes, um, but it shouldn't just be, um, you know, the first, um, this should be across all low income customers rather than just um, a certain subset of low income customers. We also said you should reject, uh, the PC should reject the profit increase from Excel's proposal, which both flies in the face of its commitment to keep um, costs, profits lower than the, like uh, escalating lower than uh, rising inflation, um, but also uh, following, I, th I think we deferred a lot to Cubs' great analysis of saying actually that profit should not only not go from 9.02 to 10.2, it should go lower than that because that's actually the risks that you're taking as a utility um, is not reflected by that high rate of return. Um, and then some of the other pieces are just, you know, pausing any subsidies to big businesses and like, like big data centers that come into the service territory until it's clear that that's actually the subsidy is creating more benefit than cost to ratepayers who are paying for that subsidy. Um, and using the commission's discretion to advance the public interest through consideration of a broader range of factors when determining um, what residential customers should be charged. So uh, why are we treating everyone the same who, regardless of um, uh, whether or not they can afford that energy, is that energy actually affordable to them, or are we basing on some arbitrary definition of affordability, um, starting to consider uh, systemic uh, underinvestment in certain areas of the grid? Um, again, those apartment dwellers versus, you know, how much how much are you actually contributing to the cost of the system? So those are some of the high level points. Um, but uh, just to kind of set the stage on, again, on like the public process and this procedural justice question is we had an audit of our um, Public Utilities Commission that came out in 2020, 2020 um, just saying that there was a pretty high level of um, dysfunction in public process and a fundamental um, burden and unfairness um, in terms of who can access being, you know, getting their voices heard in this, in this uh, regulatory system. Um, and uh, 
there was a couple of recommendations, but we saw this play out that, that these issues have not been addressed in the, the three, almost three years since. Um, the public hearings, again, this is probably gonna hit a you know, strike a chord of people who are involved in their rate cases locally, but um, sometimes in the middle of the day, sometimes immediately after work, there was nothing scheduled for the two densest parts of the state originally that are served by Excel. So St. Paul and Minneapolis did not have a public hearing scheduled. Um, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of these processes are run by state agencies who are um, under-resourced compared to the utilities, even though the utilities are prompting the need for this public hearing. And so um, eventually something was put on the schedule, but um, some of them were mislabeled in a different docket. And so people didn't know that um, the hearing was attached to this rate case versus the, a gas case. There were instances where people would show up like 30 or 40 minutes into a session that was supposed to be public hearing and the staff had already packed up and left. Um, there was other instances where the place that was hosting the public hearing didn't know at the front desk that there was a public hearing there. And so there wasn't actually evidence that it even happened. Um, I attended a couple of these public hearings um, in person and there were probably, I don't know, 10 Excel employees there, again, all being paid through our rate dollars to be there, who were there to testify, almost outnumbering the people in the room and had these huge stacks of like, they printed the entire rate cases if we're gonna, you know, go through and page through and read it on site. Um, and ironically, a lot of these, you know, folks are the same people, like the, the utility bench is so thick they're on all of our boards, all of our committees, all of our tourism, what, you know, they're everywhere. They have one of the largest lobbying presences of the Capitol that were really outnumbered. And so some of the procedural elements beyond just what the public hearings were like um, is that you start to get into these, uh, there are too many issues for just the state agencies to be able to handle like everyone has to sort of narrowly focus on, okay, like, you know, someone's covering profit and someone's covering this. And, you know, there's a, a, a mix of those issues, but it leaves out so much of, of the conversation and the expertise that communities bring or the expertise that consumer advocates bring or labor brings or all these different pieces that um, you start to see how outnumbered we are um, and how, how so much of this conversation is happening on the utilities turf. Um, that not only do we not have, you know, the number of people to kind of cut through all of the BS arguments that they're making and some of these things, or just the like oversights that they're making, frankly, or the way that their modeling is faulty, um, but that there's these dynamics that then come to play of like, okay, if, if the public hearings are so hodgepodge and like you're, you're not, it's almost like you're not prepared to receive our input as the public how do we even know that you're prepared to use that input that we do give you? Um, and I think that that was clear when, you know, this sort of looming and we talked about how to, how to talk about this element of public, of uh, the docket process, but um, there is this other power broking, power brokering dynamic of settlement agreements or settlement processes. And like, there's a level of secrecy and non-disclosure about even the fact that those things wield ginormous, like huge amounts of power, that it's hard to even be able to speak transparently about how that changes the process. And so I, you know, I can't speak about any of that in detail, but what I can say is um, that's a huge dynamic in this process is how much of this conversation is happening in a transparent way um, and really how much is the public um, able to influence this process. And so um, I just want to, uh, just highlight how awesome Chriselle's, Chriselle is also a member of the Just Solar Coalition and she and some other folks um, door knocked about a couple thousand households fielding this testimony into the, into the public process because it was not otherwise going to be heard at these hearings that were um, really not on the turf of, of our folks. Um, and uh, what else do, should I say? I, I think just Another procedural justice issue is the intervention itself. There's such a high barrier to actually intervening. Um, this was our first time officially intervening. Um, uh, you know, it's not a super clear process. I think people expect you to know the rules, you know, right from the jump. Um, and we're really grateful for the folks who have offered their time and um, uh, 
yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's still in process. So the, the, um, there's this, I guess the, the closing thing I would say just before we get into questions is, um, March 31st, there's going to be an ALJ report that will sort of summarize the case in our situation. April 17th, there'll be some opportunity for exceptions. The PUC deliberation will be in May, um, and there'll be a decision in June. Um, and so far, the utilities reception, this is like an equity is a new issue to the commission. Like it's only recently come to, to be talked about because people asked for it in the IRP. Um, and the utilities uh, reception to it so far has been, this is, and again, this is on the record, they have said, this is not the appropriate venue to talk about equity. We talk about that somewhere else in this new docket that's been created. But that's not, that's conflicting messages to what they're saying verbally. And so I think there's this issue of like needing to get the utilities on record committing to things because otherwise it doesn't, you know, that that's where the rubber hits the road is when it's on record. Um, and uh, I think how people, you know, some of the, some of the things I would just say to kind of bring this home to people is, is when, when you're in these spaces, uh, the procedural justice is a key component is like, we can advocate for policy. We also need to be looking for every single door we can open along the way so that this is easier next time. Um, so I'll pass it back to you, Erica. We can get into questions. Thank you, Alice. And thank you all of you. Uh, that was great. Um, as we're continuing to kind of collate questions that are coming in, um, let's kick off our discussion um, with this question. I know the case is ongoing, but to date, um, uh, what's been all of your biggest takeaway or lesson learned um, from intervening in this rate case? I know Timothy highlighted that it's just Solar Coalition's first time doing it. Um, so I'd be interested to hear that. And let's give Alice a little break from talking. Why don't we start with, uh, start with Timothy to answer that question? Yeah, biggest takeaways. Um, <laughs> I mean, the first one is really basic. I think just the fact that we are showing up is changing the nature of the discussion. Um, I, I, th I think there have been some moments in this process where there was a uh, reaction either from other parties or, or um, you know, from some of the uh, interactions and, and responses of, well, this isn't really where we would talk about this. And then having to grapple with the fact that, well, actually there's a lot of things that impact energy justice at play here. Um, I think that the tone of the conversation and the expectation that these issues have to be addressed um, has changed just by our showing up. Um, I think also this role of connecting what is the role of the energy transition and the movement to clean energy to affordability and, and um, justice is really powerful and something that needs to be tapped in a lot more venues. Um, because it it changes the way that people think about the conversation and what matters. Thanks, Timothy. Alice or Gabe, do you have uh, anything else that you'd highlight in addition to what Timothy said? Gabe, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah, maybe just uh, an addition to what I think Timothy and Alice both said in different ways. You know, I think that... Um, from my experience in this rate case, you see that this is a really, uh, these these decisions are gonna have a really, really long tail, you know, for decades to come. You know, even though rate cases are every couple of years, um, you know, the investments that are uh, being discussed here are long-term investments. And in general, I think that utility regulation is this kind of long run game that plays out across multiple dockets and multiple venues. And I think we've seen, you know, over the last one or two decades that in a lot of places, outside interveners like environmental groups have gotten really savvy at how to engage in those processes and play that kind of long-term game or negotiation with utilities. I think we're just at the very beginning of how communities can play this role in advocating for energy justice um, and seeing these outcomes across multiple processes and dockets. And so I think one of the lessons learned that you know, Alice said really nicely is like this is hopefully opening up some doors and changing the process for not just this rate case, but for many other cases coming forward and changing not just what we're thinking of as interveners, but also how other actors, you know, state agencies, the PUC itself, think about these issues. 
Thanks. And, and Alice, um, I'd invite you to add anything and also kind of um, emphasize or add anything to what you already said about getting voices heard in the regulatory process and ways to kind of improve that stakeholder consultation process. I know you kind of mentioned some challenges, but if you have kind of any thoughts about ways we could improve it, I think it would be great to talk about that too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think participating gives a little window into what's available and what's not, even once you get here or like more adjacent to those processes is like, it's still very much the people who have access to this space are still up against a behemoth, you know, <laughs> like, um, and, I think so much of this fight is like the lesson learned for me is like there's so much to be learned from these types of cross-sector coalitions of saying we can listen and be really curious about what does the office of the attorney general know that we don't know because they've been watching the utility on this particular issue for a really long time what does labor know about the utility because they've been watching it for a really long time what are all of their sets of chess moves here of being like here's how we actually have a functional conversation with this utility that provides an essential service but we also bring insights about strategy that they may not know and combining those sets of strategy to say we actually know quite a lot more knitted together is really powerful and i think that 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 type of working relationship that we have with this set of wonderful experts and with ELPC as our wonderful legal team. And then the, the folks that we bring to the table as the Just Solar Coalition, we all have really clear sets of skills and we also have really clear sets of, of insights and expertise and knowledge that we will have a much more um, like both efficiency in terms of using our time of using those skill sets well together and also getting the outcomes that we need to see because we're not just continuing to go down this, like this is how we've always done it, is like, you know, um, bringing more people in and, and on the like, what could we do to get more voices heard, I think is like finding those, like if you bump up against a door, ask why it's there, like get, get someone like, you know, carve out the types of things that you can kind of follow and watch because it really does need the follow through to make those things happen. Um, and then start to think about like, how do we make, like, we're, we're on a playing field that's not ours right now. And like, how do we move? What is our own playing field? What is our own thing that actually makes our people feel like their voices are going to be heard and not just checking a box and shifting the conversation to more and more be a, a more mutual level of comfort of like how we're able to have this negotiation. So it's not just entirely in the comfort and, you know, power book of the utilities, but is actually uh, responding to the needs about how people need their feedback to be heard or how they what types of information they need in order to to advise on what solutions are right for their communities. Thanks. And I'll also just recognize I saw some kind of related questions come through on this is that we still are in the middle of this process. So um, someone did ask, how did the PUC react to Gabe's testimony? We don't know yet. Um, we're going to find out soon this spring. And I think, you know, we're all digesting this process and kind of still coming up with our, our lessons learned and how successful we are in the end remains to be seen, although I think we've already felt we've made some demonstrated successes to date. Um, so kind of coming back down into the weeds a little bit, um, let me, we had a few questions related to energy insecurity um, from Gabe's presentation. Gabe, I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about what that phrase means and also then talk about the systemic changes you'd envision to to address that issue for for people of color um especially as it relates to the rate case yeah so uh energy insecurity can take many different forms it can look like you know in its most extreme form being disconnected from service involuntarily but it can also look like interruptions to service just from service quality. It can look like being income constrained and having to choose between energy, food, or medicine. Um, it can look like um, keeping your house temperature at an unsafe or unhealthy level to uh, save on your energy bill. Um, it takes many different forms. In, in the figure I showed, that was using the Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration's definition. And I put a link in the um, Q&A to um, a blog post that explains more of that specific definition of energy insecurity. 
In terms of addressing energy insecurity, you know, I think that some of the recommendations Alice uh, laid out from our testimonies really give some of those concrete specific details of what we're thinking about in this rate case really as a first step, um, because many of the causes of energy insecurity are deep and systemic. They are caused by decisions made in utility regulation, but also in many other places. There are deep systemic causes that have to do with our housing policy or education policy. Uh, but that doesn't mean that utility regulation can't make a lot of progress to reduce energy insecurity. And in fact, utility regulators have an obligation under their public interest authority to do so. And so, you know, I think that energy insecurity is really multifaceted. Um, but there are some really concrete things that we can do in the short term here and then think about um, through subsequent um, proceedings. Thanks. I, I have another question for you all, but wanted to give Timothy and Alice a chance to respond to that if they had anything to say. Nothing on my end. Okay. Um, well, we were we're coming up on our our time here. Um, but I did want to maybe we'll we'll start with Alice to respond to this. Um, if you could talk about any opportunities left to weigh in on this rate case. Um, I'm I don't really think there are kind of procedural ones, but if you have any kind of um, thoughts there and or um, any opportunities at the legislature where people might weigh in or um, anything else. So I'll start with you, Alice, and then if anyone has anything to add, uh, I'll let them do that. Yeah, um, so the official process for public comments is closed, but I think if I think if you had if you read the ALJ report and found there was something missing from it, you could file an exception. Um, I think if there's a public hearing or sorry, if there's the PUC deliberation, having people in the room there is another kind of passive, passive silent. Um, it, that's part of the official process. But um, I think at this point, like one of the perspectives that we bring is sort of like, you know, the in the the official process is just one avenue to influence the work, you know, these decisions, because these decisions are made by people who live in communities. Um, and so part of it is, you know, in our context, I think there's, there's a different tenor of the conversation here. After all of the things with, um, uh, or I guess, just comparing like Excel's territory here versus Excel's territory in Colorado. Um, or center points territory here and center points territory in Indiana. The media coverage is very different. Um, and so I think like having the public dialogue, like that's that's something that doesn't happen inside inside the official process. It can happen anytime, anywhere. Um, and uh, Colorado's news stories are just getting some really awesome, like, why is Excel charging, you know, what is on your energy bill? Like really, really good coverage of um, trying to get the utilities to answer public questions outside of that formal process and in front of media. Um, they're breaking down how the how bill charges happen. They're breaking down all these different things. And in Minnesota, there was some coverage originally, but as soon as there was a, like, basically there was another request for an interim addition on top of what they already have kind of as a holding pattern for them. Um, and that was rejected as like, okay, you're not going to get a little more while you're waiting. And the headlines all characterize it as if the rate case was gone. And I think that's like a key piece of you just evaporated public awareness that this is happening just by simply mischaracterizing what's happening. So I, I think the outside world and community and dialogue is really where the pressure is at this point. Um, so would encourage people to write letters to the editor, you know, uh, that kind of that kind of thing, but also um, just talking about it, people. Thanks, um, Gabe or Timothy. Anything to add, including any uh, opportunities at the legislature in this space? This is a hard question to answer because there's so much. Um, you know, this isn't this rate case intervention isn't exactly a first step. We've been taking many other steps before. But I think we're still really early in terms of getting people to think differently about how our energy system is currently working and not working and how should it work. Um, and so, 
you know, the, the opportunities for broad public input into this rape case may be somewhat limited at this point. Um, we're going to be pushing these arguments, you know, through to the conclusion in terms of seeing what we can win here. But this is really just a first step in terms of next regulatory proceedings here in Minnesota, as well as many others that are happening in other places all over the country, um, to, to, to use this different narrative and different way of looking at the connection between distributed energy and justice um, to, to reshape how we think about public policy. There are things happening in the Minnesota legislature about how do we reform uh, clean energy policy and distributed energy um, mechanisms. There are there's conversations about intervener compensation. Um, there's all of these different pressure points um, that I think we can expect will be coming up over time and and becoming ever more prominent. And the way we see um, this is a process of system systematic change. We're not going to get there in any one proceeding. Uh, but the more we can demonstrate to the public that if we really get on top of this and push for justice, we start to shift the, the narrative of the debate, the more that becomes public, publicly acceptable and politically supported thing to do. Um, so I think going forward, this is really about how do we carry this strategy and this narrative into all sorts of other places and, and processes. Thanks. And Gabe, uh, any any closing thoughts? Oh, I was just going to add to Timothy's point that I think he mentioned. You know, this is happening across the country, and you know, there are, there are. I think I said earlier we're sort of at the early stages, but there have been folks working on this for decades. And when we were writing our uh, article, got to talk a lot of them or read a lot of their writing. And there's a lot of these ideas have been around. I think the movement is really accelerating and. Um, I think, you know, being able to have these kind of dialogues that reach an audience, even though this process is very within Minnesota, but having that dialogue across states, I think, really helps understand what are the effective arguments, what are the strategies, how do we think about procedural justice and making these kind of lessons applicable outside of our community. I think that all helps to, you know, build the kind of uh, acceptability that Timothy was just referring to. So more webinars. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say from ELP's, ELPC's perspective, you know, that's one of our goals coming out of this is to take what, what we're learning here and at least in the Midwest uh, where we work to, you know, do it more in other places and to keep building building the momentum. Um, we've It's been a wonderful experience here in Minnesota and have learned a lot. So um, thank you for that. And thank you for today, Gabe, Timothy, and Alice. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, We'll send an email with follow-up resources. I saw a lot of questions about that. You will get the slides. You will get links to everything um, in that follow-up email. And we'll be doing more ELPC syncs in the future. So keep an eye out in your inboxes for an invitation. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.